If you're here for the Recovery Project live stream, you're in the right place. Uh, we're going to be talking about systemic racism in Canada and COVID-19 and, um, and uh, everything that's going wrong in the world right now, I think, is, is my understanding. So we have a really fantastic and distinguished panel of um, women with us to talk about these important issues today. So first, by way of introduction, my name is Monica Williams. Um, I'm uh, on the faculty at the University of Ottawa, where I serve as a, the Canada Research Chair for Mental Health Disparities. Um, we also have with us Dr. Brenda Green, who is an associate professor in the Department of Indigenous Health at First Nation, Nations University of Canada uh, in Regina, Saskatchewan. We also have with us Cheryl Prescott, who is the executive director at a, a community health center in one of Toronto's most marginalized neighborhoods. Um, we also have Roberta Timothy, who's an assistant professor in the teaching stream and is the director of health promotion at Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And finally, um, Yolanda James, who was the first elect elected uh, official to the Quebec National Assembly for the writing of Nelligan in 2004, and she now works as a political analyst. So, so those are the wonderful people we have with us today. And, um, and I'm so glad you could all make it. And we're just going to jump right in and I'm going to throw a question out there um, to, uh, to our panelists. The first one is I want to start with, with the context of where we are now. And how is the current state of health and social services provision experienced by racialized Canadians? Well, I, I can start if that's okay, Monica. Yeah. But, um, I think the root causes are well known. We, we know that they are the social determinants of health. We know they have, have, are deeply connected to employment, education, social services, access to services, and so on. But I think the other thing is, is that we fail to understand how these services can address uh, issues such as cultural loss, um, racism, stigmatization, loss of language, loss of connection to land, and so on and so forth. And we also don't understand how these organizations really support spirituality of the individual and of the group, and uh, how do they emotionally and, and, and uh, mentally uh, address some of the other issues that are going on in a person's life. So. Part of the issue, I think, in health and with marginalized people is that one, we can't put a blanket over everything and say everybody is going to be like this. We cannot generalize our services. And that's one thing I think that is done a lot in policy. We have generalized per, uh, policies and laws that do not if, uh, influence or affect the health of the individual. Yeah, great, great points. And you're absolutely, absolutely right. Anyone else want to jump in on that one in terms of the current state of uh, the health services? What works? What doesn't? Does anyone do this well? So I, uh, I'd like to jump in here. So in addition to what uh, Brenda just mentioned around the social determinants of health, I believe there's still lots of structural racism within our healthcare system. So we still have um, unequal access to certain populations, including in Canada, to francophones, for example, in certain provinces, to um, in the, it, definitely the indigenous population, and the racism and discrimination that happens against certain groups, like the black community, is still there. We have evidence of people, for example, that go to the hospital emergency departments with sickle cell disease when they're in a crisis in deep pain, and they're thought of as drug seekers, and they're sent away, or they're criminalized, actually, because they're, it's thought that they are looking for um, narcotics. But this is a real problem and it's not well understood within our medical system, unfortunately. And that's, again, that's not right. Uh, uh, maybe if I could just jump in as I, to, to uh, tag on to what both uh, Dr. Green and, and Cheryl were saying with respect to how it's um, articulated on the ground. I know here, you know, in the midst of COVID, um, one of the reasons, and, and I know that this has been um, a challenge for people who have not been following um, uh, issues with respect to um, systemic racism, uh, as I look to 
the fact that um, Quebec is a province where we've had the highest number of COVID cases and among the highest deaths and specifically with respect to um, senior citizen homes, one of the communities that were at the forefront and are at the forefront of helping these residents are uh, Black Haitians in Montreal. And in any other circumstance with any other population, governments at all levels would have been the first to raise a hand to say, hey, we've got to be able to make sure that they're um, 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 not un only taken care of, but that, that their situation with respect to their um, documentation is, 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 is regularized. I'm translating in my head, I apologize for that. And in this case, this is a blatant situation where that has not been the case to the contrary. Nobody wants to touch it. So I think, and the reason why I wanted to put that example out there, because it's just another layer, another situation where people of, um, Black people in this case, but visible minorities are faced with injustices and that there is no action taken. So there's naming it and there's being able to do that in COVID in Montreal right now, it's happening and it's not changing. I, I'd like to just echo on that too, is that uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, the highest rate of COVID deaths and diseases are in our rural Northern communities, indigenous communities. So again, it's the same uh, type of um, pockets of racial discrimination that the government is not, or policy is not addressing regarding COVID. And, um, and it's and it's and it goes back to those uh, determinants of health, right? I mean, they're overcrowded to housing, they're poor housing. There's lack of sanitation. There's lack of uh, adequate uh, health services, and so on and so forth. And and plus, they live in poverty. Many people live in poverty in some of our First Nations communities. So again, it's it's the Black community, as you said, in in uh, places such as Quebec. But there's also the indigenous people that are are these pockets of discrimination. Absolutely, yeah. right. And and um, just to piggyback on that, uh, you know, in terms of talking about the hardest hit areas, I, I I would also love to hear your thoughts about the fact that uh, that Canada we're not collecting data around uh, race and ethnicity on COVID infections. I mean, how how does that make sense? I I want to address this. I think. Um, just to, to echo all the other amazing um, speakers and presenters today, um, we have to remember that Canada is a country that is a white colonial set of, you know, settlement, that we, um, you know, that the Indian Act is still something that is governed in terms of Indigenous people's lives. And I think uh, what I call health violence, the health violence before COVID is really important to understand that health disparities existed, you know, for African, um, indigenous and racialized, marginalized communities for many, many years, um, over 400 years, actually, and that this is a continuation. So the intensity now of COVID, um, you know, and the experiences of, again, health disparities is based on past and current experiences of health violence, right? So that when we see that there's not race-based testing for COVID, this is not just a 2020 situation. We've been asking for race-based data and you know, social, economic, and intersectional data for many, many years. There's many uh, you know, community health centers that have, have, have this data. Cheryl can talk about it. I work in community health centers that have data that say you know, that there's violence that, that we are experiencing in our communities, and yet there's not race-based data. Um, and our government, you know, our government and our public health um, folks have argued in many ways saying that, you know, we don't need it. And recently now we're hearing that anti-Black, they were saying anti-Black racism is a public health issue, which we know, you know, anti-Indigenous racism is a public health policy, uh, a public health crisis, which we know. So the not collecting the data is part of the health violence, not Absolutely. giving numbers to not prove what's happening. Yeah, excellent points. Thank you. So, were there more comments around that? Well, I, I just want. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> well, go ahead. Okay, I wanted to follow up on the data piece as well because you know, uh, uh, working in the community health center, uh, we as a group of Black leaders have actually made we early on in this pandemic made a call to collect data here in Toronto and Ontario. 
after, especially after seeing what we were seeing in other parts of the world, in the US, in England. And, you know, we know, we anecdotally, and I think just following up on another point that was made in that we know that this is not a new problem. Health inequities have led to poor health in many, many communities, including the indigenous and black communities. And studies in the US already are showing that the black um, African Americans that are showing up in the hospital with COVID have more comorbidities. They are sicker to begin with. With the addition of COVID, they are the ones who are going into the ICU beds and they're the ones that are dying. So they, in compared to white um, Americans, there's one in 1,600 deaths among the black community in certain states. And that is an appalling fact. And I think in Canada, if we're not looking at that and if we're not collecting data, we will not know where to put our targeted interventions and really where those, uh, again, those interventions are needed the most, and that is equity. Unfortunately, we don't understand that word very well, even though we use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to just add one thing if possible with the, the data. Who collects the data is also critical. We, you know, there's a whole history and history of scientific racism in the Canadian context of who collects this data and how they use it to surveil us in our communities. So when we're talking about collecting data, we want to be the ones who actually analyze the data and are able to come up with the interventions for our communities that we've been doing for years with very little funds. So I just want to say it does matter who collects the data. Yes, very well said. Yolanda, did you please? No, no, I, just, I think there's one of the reasons why um, we're all so eager to jump in on this topic is because we understand um, at its root how it's the basis and it has been the crutch for inaction, political inaction for a long time. In that if you don't have the data, it could always, you could always fall back on opinion and well, it's not so bad or we, we just don't know or that's how you see it, but that's not how I see it. But I think in the discussion and the important discussions we've been having in the past uh, a couple of weeks, but way before that amongst us, if we could just push to the fore to pull up even more how important the question of data is so that um, allies can also understand that data is the diagnosis. You know, when you have the data and it's collected correctly, it's hard for, uh, it's harder for the powers that be to not be held accountable because it's in your face. It's not an opinion. So I just wanted to reiterate that because we see it, we see it now, uh, even for those leadership that are denying things like systemic racism, even today, yes, it's happening. You, when you have the data, you're able to say, yeah, but tell me how this happens. Tell me how you have 26,000 less people of this and doing that. So, you know, um, I just would hope that when we talk about priorities of what's there, certainly at the beginning, if we could really continue to push on, on, on the data, it's our diagnosis, it's the foundation, and that's how we're able to talk about solutions once we are, have the, the information. Yeah, such important points, right? If we don't have data, then they can't, then they can't say, oh, uh, there's a problem. We can sweep it under the rug. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Brenda. Yeah, uh, I've, uh, thank you very much for this conversation and, and spearheading the issue around uh, data collection. The other issue is, is that you said it's not uh, who collects the data, but how it's collected. And I think that is something that's definitely missing in policy development because we often look at uh, statistical analysis and, and numbers to determine snapshots in time, basically. But there's such more... Um, um, meaningful and personal issues that are that affect how we uh, talk about data and how people engage in the research process. So I, I know that uh, there's a, a huge movement across Canada to to change how research is done with Indigenous people and, and people who are uh, marginalized and yet we still see a lot of the um, uh, grand pieces of paper going into people's houses where they have to uh, check boxes. And this isn't getting to the uh, guts of the issue when it comes to racism or healthcare or marginalization. We, we just have to look at the missing and murdered women's inquiry to, to look at how badly that was um, conceptualized, right? And so when people start telling their stories, there has to be a mechanism in place to support these people 
over a long period of time. And, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about historical trauma and how this re-traumatizes people again. So thank you very much for bringing up the issue around data collection. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to go on to the next, uh, next question I have uh, for the group. Um, health disparities differ for a host of economic and social reasons. What can we do to actually reduce these inequities in health outcomes other than collect the data, which I, I think is a pretty uh, clear and com there's a pretty clear and compelling need for that one. I would say, um, you know, continuing on with the truth and reconciliation, um, you know, giving resources like reparations for Indigenous and African -Kin communities. We need resources to be able to create programs that, you know, that we know work, that we know are effective. Um, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of training that needs to be done, and I think it's anti-oppression or decolonized training. I'm not a fan of uh, bias um, training, but anti-oppression decolonizing training in health. But I also think it's about money. You know, um, there's a lot of looting that has happened um, historically and currently in terms of African Indigenous resources. And I think if we have the resources and money and the paybacks that we deserve in our community um, for the health really um, brutalities that have happened in our communities, then we can use some of those resources because we have the leadership, you know, we have the leadership to actually do the programming and doing, doing the, you know, things such as housing, which we need to look at um, poverty and other, other factors. So we need the resources that should be given back to us from leaving in our communities. And I think the change can then happen in different ways. I would just insist on the importance of education. Um, it is still shocking to me to see how um, uneducated collectively, whether we're talking about reconciliation, whether we're talking about um, the reality of uh, visible minorities, black people within the country. Um, and I, I feel like that would be a, a great start in terms of being able to understand exactly what's happening in our neighborhoods so that we can address the disparities that are, that are, that are happening. I just wanted to raise that point. I'd like to add that, um, and it's tied to reparations, it's tied to education. Representation in the healthcare field would also be helpful. Um, but unfortunately, we know that poverty is racialized um, in Canada. And so many access to medical school or a lot of the professional degrees that we need for some of our mainstream services um, are, is just not there. So we know that, I know that at U of T, for example, the black students, uh, medical students is, you know, have been really, they've been some initiatives to really increase representation. You know, many, a few years ago, there were zero or perhaps one medical student admitted to the uh, School of Medicine. This year, there were 24. And that's a big thing to be celebrated, but it's still not enough. And, but again, it goes back to perhaps that access because the, you know, the funding, the, you know, the access to um, money to attend university is beyond so many communities. Um, and there needs to be some sort of system to repair that. Yeah, great, great points. Very important. I'm just thinking now about my own program, the clinical psychology program that we have at the University of Ottawa. And it's, it's a very large program, but there are maybe two black students enrolled, which is just, you know, shocking and not acceptable. And I also wanna put it out there that if you are thinking of graduate school in psychology, please apply with me. I'm looking mm -hmm. at for black students so we can, so that we can sort of mix these numbers up a little better. <laughs> yeah, Brenda. Sure. Um, I, I absolutely agree with everybody, what everyone has said. I think, too, the other thing, the other issue is that we have to put our post-secondary institutions in, in communities. And having these large silos in the middle of a city that I cannot reach, I cannot access. And it's difficult for me if I am a rural person who I lived on a reserve for my entire life, and then I'm expected to go to a city and function as uh, I know everything that's going on. Many of our students don't even know how to take a bus or, or they don't know where they can get help for financial help or they, they don't purchase their a computer for their work. They, they don't have that context of what it takes to be a successful student. 
Uh, often what we try to do at this university of have, is have our community-based programs where we take the community and go to those rural areas. Uh, sometimes they're successful and sometimes they're not as, as successful, but at least we're trying to implement um, accessibility for students. I, I think that's a really important point um, that Dr. Brenda Green made and everyone. Um, in terms of the, I I'm, I'm want to now talk a little bit about the content of what we learn in our educational system. So the content is very colonial and very um, white-centered or Eurocentric. And ha we have students from our communities who are going to these schools. We've all gone to them, I'm sure. And, you know, they experience a lot of violence, you know, a lot of violence that makes people drop out, makes people not wanting to be. So holding the universities accountable for also, um, you know, decolonizing their curriculums and um, doing anti-oppression work is really, really important because I'm, I'm also a psychotherapist and I can tell you the amount of students and amount of people in my you know, practice, because they're mostly black and racialized and indigenous folk who come for experiencing violence on a daily basis in academia and, and in their work environment. So we have to do work in, in that area in a big way because the education we're getting is actually quite problematic. So how do we decolonize the education system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, ex excellent points. Um, we have a couple questions coming through from our audience. I think we, our audience is very engaged here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put one of the questions out um, in, uh, for you. Uh, the first one is during this pandemic and with the attention Black Lives Matter has received, we see many organizations issuing statements and providing big plans for action against systemic racism. How do we hold these institutions accountable both externally and internally? Mm, that's a good question. Right? I mean, <laughs> and we need a whole hour web webinar on how to do that. Yeah, I mean, everybody's been sending me wonderful statements that sounds absolutely fantastic. I mean, every organization I'm a part of, you know, places where I just do banking, uh, but but do they mean it? And, and, and how do we know? Well, we'll see. And it, it is connected. If I could answer to that part it, for there's the exterior, there's the maintaining the pressure and keeping the message visible so that people are paying attention then that's one aspect of it but i'm, I'm certainly can maybe speak from a government point of view internally to, to make that structural change happen there has to be a buy-in and we're certainly not in not there yet um, um and i feel like it's a question of being able to I want to make a, almost a parallel of what I've seen and what I believe when there's not only political will, but a civil service buy-in, things can happen positively. Um, in the early 2000s, in this province, there was, because of data, there was a consciousness on the level of poverty in, within this province. And legislators in general and everybody understood, this is unacceptable and we need to institutionally make some changes. So there was legislation adopted to make sure that um, with the indicators, every department was able to, with through investment, through community activism, through um, 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 uh, uh, different measures, not only make sure that we were acting on this issue, but there were objectives, there were um, moments that they had to be held accountable, come back to the National Assembly and say, hey, this is where we are and this is where um, uh, the goals that we'd set. So I kind of feel like, I know, not that kind of feel, I know that if this conversation internally um, within our institutions is going to change, that action has to happen on within the inside from the receptionist to the CEO. And, um, uh, this is the moment where that that ask and that not uh, that pressure has to be maintained within government. It can't just be from a speech. It can't just be by a couple of appointments. It has to be on every level. Oh, excellent points. Very well said. Uh, and anyone else want to chime in on that one? Yeah, <laughs> I I will. I think it's a really important question. It's interesting because when you ask about the context, I wanted to say the, of COVID. The context of COVID is that. Um, black and Indigenous folks are dealing with so much violence and brutality from the police that even during a pandemic, people are going out to protest. It tells you what the risks that people are willing to take. So I think that when I see, you know, the, the statements, I'll tell you the truth, I get, I get different emotions depending on what day I'm in. You know, um, sometimes when I see Royal Bank, you know, Canada and the history of student loans for me, I, I'm like, 
you know, what is your accountability? A statement is nothing without an accountability plan. What are you going to implement? How are you going to make changes? I, I'm not saying that the statements are not okay, but I think when it's statements that are co-opted to say something to, you know, increase the, we know that the political economy of diverse people's money, you know, that we, we, we shop and we spend things. So I think it's really important. Uh, I come from the old school. I was raised in the anti-apartheid movement as a kid and the feminist movements. And what we did was we boycotted everything. And, you know, people need to show up or step up or step out. You know what I mean? So I think people, we have to hold accountable. If people are making statements and they're not following through, then, you know, let's use our money. Let's use our economic power, what I call revolutionary money, to not give money for people who are not accountable with actual uh, implementation and actual actions that we can see. Because then it's just talk. Mm -hmm. Here, here. <laughs> Uh, just to add to that too, and thank you very much for those those comments. But I think this, the other thing that we have to look at is is, is our history right now. What we're, what's happening right now, and how, and how we go forward. I think the Me Too movement had generated a lot of fear for a lot of institutions and a lot of white middle class men. I'm going to get emails on that one, but uh, that this type of uh, uh, sexism in an organization is simply not allowed anymore. There are consequences for that. And I think because of this movement right now, Black Lives Matter, um, um, Indigenous rights, is that people are really conscious of what the outcome can be if they don't act uh, and support all people in Canada. And so there, there's a political movement certainly there, but I think there's a shift in, in our thinking. The other issue I, I, I'm just gonna throw out here is just an observation is that when we look at the COVID-19 and how people are, are um, protesting in the streets and the number of people and the passion and the integrity of the people, it's, it's, it, it, come, it, it's, it reminds me of that finally, people of color and indigenous people are asking white people to stand up and, and be an ally, ally or get out of the way, basically. And so I get this, these questions a lot in my classes. I'm a white middle class woman and I teach indigenous studies, basically. So I teach history, I teach about trauma and students come up to me at the end of my class almost every year and ask, why are you teaching this class? Why isn't an indigenous person teaching this class? And so, Finally, I think we're, we're shifting our thinking that white people need to be involved in these revolutionary thinking and address power relations and address marginalization because it affects all of us. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, this isn't, this isn't just a minority problem or an indigenous problem. This is an everyone problem, right? All Canadians contribute to these dysfunctional systems or are impacted by them. Wonderful. We, we have a couple interesting uh, comments and statements around our discussion about the data. I just want to read some of them out loud. Um, one of them was, um, first of all, uh, someone is pointing out, I work in affordable housing in Alberta and we aren't allowed to collect race and ethnicity data on applicants or tenants because of privacy and discrimination concerns. We have a whole missing picture of who we're serving or who's in need uh, to be able to influence policy. Um, curious if anyone has experience in this area in, um, to be able to sensitively collect data and inform policy. And another question here, how do you place trust in a system that gathers data? How can you ensure a source ensures and uses confidentiality with the integrity to utilize the data, pulling all collective data to the greater good how do we, we change attitudes? So I think that this question about the data has really, uh, really hit a nerve here um, and, and it's such an important issue. I can start with that, please. <laughs> so yeah. I think privacy legislation has been utilized to, uh, as a couch, you know, to couch this whole uh, debate. You know, when it was first asked to collect data, it was, oh, we cannot, we're, we're, you know, we'd be abusing our powers. However, the data that's being asked to be collected is not individual data. It's aggregated data. It's data that will help us to make better informed decisions. Um, and it's, it's, it's to really look at how we can adequately resource certain communities. For example, in the community that my community health center works at, is located, 
high um, number of black individuals, high poverty rates and whatnot. So I need to use some of the data. I have to, we have to collect data so that we can ensure that we're, we advocate for the right resources, the level of resources to, to deal with under chronic under resourcing of those communities that were actually built by our system. You know, so we, you know, it's the, it's not about, you know, invading privacy. It's about, we, we are messaging to our client population and our community is we collect the data because we care and we're being responsible about it. Um, we talked about this earlier about, you know, just data stewardship. Who does the data belong to and how do we utilize it? So, I mean, this is something that, again, has to be embedded into policy, but it is around how proper decision and responsible decision making, in my opinion. Thank you for that. That makes so much sense. Um, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the uh, police brutality problem that um, that we've seen uh, in the states. You know that this is sort of catalyzed, galvanized. Um, you know the the protests and activism that's happening in the states right now and now all over the world. Um, and so this isn't the first time that police brutality has. Uh, has rocked Canada and the world, and why is it different this time? And do we think that it'll lead to reform of police here in Canada? Um, what, what do we need to do to make sure that happens? <laughs> okay, I guess I'll go. Um, I Maybe to the first part of your, your question, um, what makes it different now? I just, I'm not sure. I'll speak for my city for what I'm not sure that it will be different now. I'm hopeful that it will be different now, but the evidence is not yet clear to me that it will be. Um, I'm hopeful in that, in the respects of I've seen that, especially the younger generation, a lot of people are not accepting it anymore. But when I look to, again, the response of leadership, it's still well you know there are people that are don't that are racist but we're not all racist or you know we do criminal profiling and i feel in a lot of ways that um when i hear that it triggers me i'll also feel like well we're we're not only not moving forward i feel like we're backing up um so i feel like the studies have been done the data is there. I mean, I could speak to the Montreal De Police Department uh, and specifically, they even ordered their own independent report that confirmed that if you are Indigenous, Black, that you are four to six times like more likely to be stopped by the police, yet they still can't seem to find the words. Um, so, and that's an important part of it. Uh, uh, so to answer your question in terms of what has to be done in terms of uh, first, can we, get to a point where people have to name things and see things for what they are uh, factually. And um, uh, the rest, I think, will go from there. But unfortunately, um, I'll say in this province um, so far, and I, I know that it's true throughout the rest of the country, we certainly haven't made those um, that step yet. Thank you. I, I want to just add to this conversation. Yeah. Um, as a young person, you know, I used to protest against police violence and brutality. I remember going to Wade Lawson, I was a young teenager, Lester Donaldson, you know, the marches that were organized and, and being involved in the community. So it's actually a continuation of, you know, the murdering of black and indigenous people. We know it was Regis who just was, was uh, suspiciously fell out of her balcony. We know that Chantal Moore, know that there's a history of actually over you know 400 years but even looking at the 2000s um, looking at you know um, DeAndre Campbell looking at people who have you know mental health issues and her then ed end up dead in our communities that this is a this is a kind of a, a police state action that happens within the within the Canadian context and I think that will you know it's not only in Canada yes but I think Canada we forget that Canada is um, has a history of African enslavement, of indigenous, indigenous genocide, of all of these criminalizations, you know, Code Noir, Indian Act. It's a continuation of, of police state and police surveillance within, um, within our communities. So uh, when I see 2020, it's a continuation. And yes, there's resistance, and we have been resisting for many, many years. I, I don't see changes happening unless really um, there are, you know, resources not only taken away, 
from the police, but more important, the accountability. What is the accountability of the over-criminalization of Black and Indigenous communities in Canada? And you can see that there's a global connection. We can see Brazil, we can see United States, UK. So there's a global connection, but what is the Canadian context? We like to look at other doors instead of our own backyard. And there is, mm -hmm. there is brutality that happens on a daily basis within our community from the police. Yeah. Yeah, now, you know, there are public officials who have denied the existence of racism and have argued that Canada's multicultural diversity is enough proof that we're not racist. What would you say to that? I think anyone with black skin will really argue that. Um, as, um, as a mother of a black son, this is a very painful time for many of us, and especially in leadership positions where we have to listen to this over and over. Unfortunately, I have personal experience in my family of a young person that was killed by police because he had a mental health issue and his mother called for help. 10 years later, oh. after many, many inquests, the same thing happened weeks ago with this young woman, Regis. It's, 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 it's criminal. And unfortunately, the people who are further criminal, criminalized are the members of the black community, the indigenous communities, and it's nothing is being done. So what is being said and the defense is, is ludicrous. Um, and, you know, we, I think right now, you know, seeing the protests, seeing the riots, the, the protests on the street, the young number of young people, black, white, of all races, all genders, you know, we have to look at this. We have to look at the impact on mothers who are suffering. Um, I don't, you know, the, just the, the whole gender question is there as well, is that people are not able to deal with this and there are no resources to support them when these things happen. The, the impact, the wider impact on communities when they see their friends and their loved ones being killed, it, it's a genocide that is being ignored and Canada should be ashamed. We should not wait. We should not have waited to see that, that knee on the uh, neck of a black man in the US. That should not, we should not have waited for that. We see the, the response because COVID had us all on lockdown. So we were able to, we were home, we had time, everyone saw it. Social media is, is amplifying it, but it's, it has to stop. And I think um, what's going on right now in the world, I hope, and I hope that this is what has, will give us the impetus to really uh, do some further thinking about the needs for a different way of policing. The, the talk of defunding policing is, is still questionable. We have to figure out what that means, but we need to figure out how to invest better in, in our human beings in this world. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the issue that a lot of people have been talking about surrounding police and defunding police. Um, you know, you could argue that law enforcement institutions were never built to protect people of color. I mean, and I can just speak to that from my own personal experience, and I'm sure all of you have stories too. I was assaulted once by my ex, who's white, and I called the police and they sent me away and took his side. I've been stopped by police for jogging in my... My screen froze. You know what? They, I pay for their services and I can't use them. Your screen is freezing. Yes. I can't okay, wasn't just me. Don't, I'm sorry. I can't call the police. I can't use that service. What do you guys have to say? No, it's just that I think your screen was freezing for a bit there. I, I missed a part of it. Yeah. yeah, I couldn't hear your conversation at all. I'm sorry. I was just saying that I, I pay tax money for the police like everyone else, but I can't use them. So I say defund them. What do you guys think? Again, I'm gonna take it from a political point of view, is that what I don't like about, the, I, I understand and I agree with the fundamentals of it, which is saying we, we have to be able to invest in our communities. That's what defund the police is but from a political analyst point of view what i don't like about defund the police you're giving them a crutch you're giving them something to hang on to to not hang on so look if we're talking about investing our communities and making sure that the money is going in the right place and we probably shouldn't have been putting it there and let's say that but when we say defund the police you give people that need to because we we're talking about having the importance of everybody or or the buy-in so that we can move forward i feel that that has allowed for people to kind of deconstruct it and then 
again, we're giving ourselves another layer to fight on something that we shouldn't, that, that in an issue that's already um, challenging enough daily to have to move forward. That's my reaction to it at this point in time. Yeah, yeah, great points. Uh, anyone else want to jump in on that one, uh, that hot potato? You know, I think I've, I've said I've said a little bit already about it. I think that there needs to be a discussion about what that looks like. I said I think it's very challenging in a colonial state and a police state to actually um, defund the police. However, I think that you know the police being accountable needs to be talked about. The, the police being criminalized needs to be talked about. Um, you know, in terms of um, changing the police state, I'm all for it. Can we, you know, there's a whole notion of abolish, abolition of, you know, prisons because the history of prisons were built on, you know, after enslavement to incarcerate African Indigenous folks. There's bigger and larger discussions. I think that, that we need to define the terms of what we're talking about. You know, do they need to be accountable? Do they need to be criminalized for violence? Do they need to stop killing Black folks and Indigenous folks? Yes. Do they need to, if, 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 if not giving them resources, then has a police force that is not funded very well and still killing people, then we're not doing anything. So it has to come with like, you know, policy, uh, implementation, actions, and the whole change of our dismantlement of a colonial system, which is a larger project, which hopefully doing anti-oppression and resistance work we are a part of. So it's a larger discussion that I think we need to have. Yeah, and I, I think I want to add to that too, is that um, when we look at the RCMP and uh, the various provincial and, and police forces in Canada, when something goes wrong in that police force, when somebody is charged for doing something wrong, they are um, evaluated by other police and that has to stop. They need an external unbiased committee to look and investigate all these charges because right now it's not going to change as long as there, it, there's a there's a culture of protection out there. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to throw out there and we're talking about uh, institutions and racism and how it's built into all these organizations in uh, at the University of Regina uh, last year some of you may have heard about this and may or not but they often have um, leaders come in and talk about or artists talk about racism and whatever and we had one person invited by the administration who was going to have read the poetry of the murderer of Pamela George and now Pamela George was an Indian woman that was uh, raped and murdered by two young affluent uh, white men in in Canada in, in the 1990s 1995 I think it was and so they barely didn't get any um, criminal time at all, either of them. Uh, the judge was biased. Uh, he made some very racist statements. So it's not only the police has to change, the whole justice system has to be reinvented, I think. I don't think we can live without some sort of policing force. I, I honestly don't believe that, but it has to change in its mechanism. So when this invited scholar came, was coming to our university. There was uh, uproar in the community that the poetry of the murderer was going to be read at this evening gala. It was just unbelievable to think that we are so tone deaf about what's going on in, in society as an institution, right? But uh, back to the policing problem, um, it has to also include uh, the prison reform, uh, corrections reform, both at the provincial and the federal level, um, policing reform, both at the provincial and federal, and certainly with judges. I think judges, there was supposed to have been um, an order passed in, in the government that didn't wasn't passed through the Senate that judges should have training on sexual abuse and, and uh, rape, what that means actually. So it did want to I just want to add that the Special Investigation Unit was actually created in Ontario because of resistance in terms of the Black community and the murdering of Black folks. And we know that the SIU has very problematic and hasn't been a very supportive, um, you know, place where we can actually get justice. Um, so, you know, there's also looking at our CAS, our Children's Aid Society systems, you know, which are also incarcerating our children. We have to look at, um, you know, the educational system, which is a different type of incarceration, you know, the, the, the pipeline that people often talk about. Um, I also want to talk about the mental health. You know, I, I just want to say to Cheryl and to Monica, you know, to hear your stories, and we all have our own, but I just want to say, uh, you know, I'm sorry to hear your stories and your loss, because we don't have time to mourn 
our grief for the, the amount of violence we experience on a daily basis. So I just want to say, I hear you, I see you, and I feel you. And we need to talk about also the, the mental health impact of criminalization, of violence on a daily basis, of having to come on here and advocate for our communities who are living and dying every minute. So I just want to say, I honor you. And you know, also looking at the transgenerational trauma and impact of this violence on a daily, daily basis that we're still dealing with you know, in 2020. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you so much. And I think you know, one of the big questions everyone is asking is how do we fix these systems? And, and so many of you have put forth so many, good, so many good suggestions and ideas. And as a researcher myself, I often hear people asking these questions, how do we fix this? How do we do that? And I'm, I'm like, well, you know, there have been like 50 articles published on how to do that, right? So I feel like we have the knowledge that yeah. we need to fix these things. And really, is it just a matter of will? What stops, what stops us from implementing things that have been shown to work? I I, I just wanted to react to that because I do think it is a question of will at this point. Um, uh, Roberta has been talking about accountability. I just look at my own experience with respect to being raised by parents that have been active and Anthony Griffith and talking with her as police and on and then their parent. It's been years, years that communities have been advocating and saying the same thing. So when we talk about what's the solution, I almost can't hear that anymore because there have been so many brilliant people like you and for years that have written the papers, that have done the research. And I just wish we, uh, it does not just wish, I just know that it comes from a will to say, okay, now's the time. So now's the time. So let's get that, that report and we're gonna do it. And I've seen this again, I take it from my own experience in, in, in government on other issues unrelated to this. When there is an issue that um, government feels is um, important enough to handle, it is handled and it is revisited and there is accountability. I just want this moment in time to be true um, for all issues with respect to systemic racism. That's, that's my, what, what I want, <laughs> what I hope for. And I would just add that um, I think while there's, we see little political will amongst our leaders, right, our leadership right now, I think where I'm hopeful <laughs> is among the young people. Because since you know, this, um, this new uprising, young people are starting to be brave enough to share their stories. And those yeah. stories are horrendous. And I think, uh, we, I just hope uh, that we can empower them, we can encourage them, those of us who are in positions, to, to give them that voice and let them amplify it over and over. Because it is not right that young people, especially many of them, born here in Canada who are Canadians are still being told to go back home or asked where they're from and this is what you know pushes them away and pushes them to the fringes and pushes them into life that is you know often criminalized because they are angry and we, we have to stop blaming ourselves and our communities and work with each other the young people are now wanting to open up their own businesses and support black businesses and we have to figure out how to ensure that they have the kinds of funding and they have the, the, the support and mentorship to do that because they, they're, they're bright, they're, they're powerful young voices and they, they have the lived experience, unlike maybe some of us who have had to you know, navigate things in a different way to be where we are. So I'm just hopeful that we can stand by them and um, raise our own voices like we're doing today um, about the inequities and the injustices that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I just add on, I think, um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just thanking, thanking you for that com this comment, Cheryl. Yeah, go ahead, Roberta. I, I would add on, you know, our African and Indigenous ways of knowing, you know, we are a, a heterogeneous group, you know, we come from different gender, gender identities, sexual orientations, disabilities, accessibilities, etc. And there's a lot of people who are doing things right now, like we're not, you know, and I, and I would include our elders in the community, because I think if we don't remember our elders, and we don't, we're really, um, we connect the, the young and the, non, the, non, the ones that are not born because we have maternal health issues in our communities based on um, racist violence also. So I think that if we look at our uh, you know, African and indigenous traditional knowledges, we are gonna see that our communities are resisting. We know how to do this, we've done it before. You know, now it's how do, we, how do we get resources to do that? There's a lot of black businesses that are hustling, like nobody's business that started off in a flea market, you know, selling like, I don't know, 
whatever, selling like three cookies or whatever. I know I started my own, you know, businesses off that way too. You don't get the monies in the bank, you know, it doesn't matter what degrees you have, you know, what experience you have. So it's like, you know, we need to have, um, you know, a black economic co-ops, you know, we need to be able to have money to, to, to raise our communities economically and also to support in our social and health, health network. But I also want to say we are a community in resistance and we are constantly resisting. Sometimes it's not televised, televised, you know, the revolution is not always televised what we are doing. So I do want to say to all the community people who are doing it and doing it with the little, you know, the little piece of money that we have, like props up to you because you're doing it. And that's how we, we make changes in our community. You know, so I want to see more of that and also um, structural changes, of course. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. And, and also, I did get a question asking if I can share like the 50 articles. Um, <laughs> actually, I've written more like 150, but you can find them at, at www.monicawilliams.com. And I have an article like how to fix structural racism and racism like in every. So yeah, like Google Scholar answers are actually there. Uh, all right, I'm gonna put the link out there for you guys. There you go. All right, oh, go ahead. great. I I just wanted to um, uh, sort of follow up on uh, Dr. Timothy's idea about uh, seeking out advice from uh, those who hold the wisdom. I guess uh, I think it's really important that we do not marginalize uh, Indigenous worldviews, Black worldviews, and that we have to recognize there's many of them, right? And, and Absolutely. You said so I I have um, um, our, our policy and I think with a lot of organizations that are indigenous run is that you have to incorporate um, indigenous knowledge uh, elders knowledge uh, into whatever you do and that is the changing element I think in a lot of these communities that are more self-determined uh, and are practicing self-determination. They're setting their own policies, their own rules, their own legislation. They have a voice in government. They are sending people to be political allies. These, this is where it becomes together that this cultural revolution, not so much of a revolution, but the continuity of culture is absolutely uh, necessary to reduce health disparities. Uh, we've learned that through many studies, and I'm not going to say 50 studies because I don't know if there's 50 studies out there, but there's many studies that have supported the idea of cultural continuity in reducing inequities. Uh, so I just wanted to throw that out there. And the second point I wanted to make too about a changing policy is that uh, we know uh, historically that people who are marginalized, people who are homeless, people who uh, live on reserves, uh, people in poverty, do not get out and vote as much as they they can, I guess. And they hold great political power if they are supported to go voting. And so again, we can, I'm sure a lot of these communities do organize um, getting people out to vote during elections. And so that's another thing that I think needs to be uh, conceptualized when we're talking about policy is that we need to get the votes of those who are actually experiencing this trauma. Yeah, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, I guess we're, boy, the time is flying by so fast. I just want to throw one more quick thing out there. And that is how do, how do we, on a big picture, thinking about this in a big picture, how do we begin to decolonize the Canadian economy, right? So how do we bring about economic justice for everyone? Um, you know, given that the Canadian economy has forever privileged white Canadians. Anybody want to speak to that one? Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, I, I think it's, you know, ca having accountability, you know, like we are here, we are, you know, not only paying taxes, but we are a part of the, you know, the Canadian landscape. And we need the resources again that you know to do to do what we need to do for our economy. I mean, I come from a working class environment, you know, going to school, I, I just finished paying my student loans and I'm proud of that. But it comes from, you know, going in 
um, to the banks with a, a really clear, clear, clear record to get a loan was no, like, you know, it was like, you can't do this. So they tell you to get education. They tell you to get their, their, their you know, their, their education, yet they don't give you the monies to do what you need to do. So we really have to, you know, reform our um, banking system and we need to hold accountability for the violence that happens in our banking system. I also believe in old school um, African susus and other, you know, indigenous types of ways of saving in our community. If, if the banks were not gonna, not gonna be responsible or accountable for our monies, then maybe we shouldn't be in, in these banks. You know, I think we need to look at really um, innovative ways of generating money and holding, holding um, not only the government, but also the banking systems or big business accountable for our resources. We are a big percentage of buyers. We buy a lot. We are, you know, politically savvy in our, our economy and we need to hold people accountable um, for not giving us resources and create other alternative ways of, of banking. That's what I'm um, when you, I, I agree with that um, 100%. And when you asked your question, uh, Monica, my first reaction was to say, uh, we don't only vote every time we go to the ballot box every four years, but every time we buy, we vote. 100%. And if we can um, be conscious of that, not just in the flush of the action and mobilize around that, um, corporations, organizations, governments will pay attention and they will pay attention quickly. I feel like, yes, we were right to name and call out uh, and use every platform we can to do that, but I find the quickest way to be able to do that is that way and people will pay attention. Yeah, yeah, when they feel the pinch, right? The pocketbook pinch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, as we're as we're wrapping up here, is there any any last comments that any of you would like to to make or parting thoughts? What should we remember as we as we leave here today? Yes. Um, I'll start. Um, I think that um, I mean we know what the problems are. <laughs> We've identified them, articulated them very well. It's now we're problem solving, solution time. And I do think that, you know, the last point about economic, um, economics is, is one that without that, you know, our communities will not be able to, to strive and um, improve its conditions. And I know that right now, again, I'm going back to the youth that, that we work with in communities who are saying things like, we need to have our own businesses. We have to support our businesses. We have to, again, the pinch has to be felt by the others that are not including us in, in, in this society. So I think that's there. But we also have to call on those folks with the power and the privilege to share it. Because unless they're willing to do it, there will be no room at the top for the rest of us. Um, so, you know, hospital boards, leadership, they have to, university boards, you know, they are, they are some of the worst and things will not change once, you know, as long as we have the, the lack of representation that we have at those levels. So. Thank you. My two cents. I could say so much more, but <laughs> mm -hmm. excellent. Um, I think also giving like organizations like you know the that where Cheryl works in the community health centers, giving resources to uh, more resources and not having um, you know nonprofit organizations have to scramble and and fight for resources. I think that you know there's a lot of even economic, social economic programs that can happen through. Community health centers, you're, you're connected to people in, in terms of health right there. Um, and I also want to say, in terms of the mental health needs, you know, doing this work, um, actively doing this work, and being, you know, our ancestors doing this work, etc., we need to take care of ourselves because people are dying from this work also. And I'm talking about activism, I'm talking about, you know, being advocacy work and the mental health impacts and the physical impacts of dealing with racism and racist policy on a daily basis kills us. So taking care of ourselves and our community members is critical to continuing um, in, the, in this work. So I do want to put that, that's my last word. Oh, excellent point. I, Cause I feel like I'm about to keel over. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, can I just say, um, maybe in just closing, I agree with that, that first I'm really happy to be able to participate in and thank you for organizing to the recovery project for organizing this discussion. And as, as much as it's been a heavy and a difficult time in general, I can't tell you when I look at the positive, just meeting ladies like you and discovering across the country in these discussions, 
Um, how many times I, I, and I know others have felt alone over the past years, but to discover um, and meet and connect with other strong women, black women and, and, and men too that are, that are advocating for the same thing has also been really, um, uh, it's given me juice, <laughs> it's given me some gas. Um, so I'm hoping that that will be a positive outcome too, that this, this connection can continue to build and get stronger going forward. So thank you. I, I, I too would like to add a thank you to, to the panel. It's been very enlightening and, and uh, I wish I could give you a virtual hug, but I can't. So um, one of the things that I just want to leave with is that, and it has been mentioned throughout this whole course of this conversation, is that we need action, we need immediate action, but it needs to be meaningful for the people who are affected by this. So any type of policy, any type of change, laws, uh, regulations, anything, all discussions, uh, at, um, allotment of money, or whatever the funds, whatever the case is, it has to be meaningful by to the people who are affected by that process. And so, again, go back to right to the very beginning: how we collect that data, how we engage in our communities, um, who do we talk to, who is doing the research. Those are the those are the key um, processes, I think. In, in, in implementing meaningful change in society against racism. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all of your voices and, and, and all of you for being here. I, I feel so fortunate to, to be here again with, with all of you. You've got so much to offer. And, um, and, and I'm sure that, and I know our audience has been very enriched by all of the wisdom that you've had to share. <laughs>